All right, so I told you to open up to Genesis chapter two, and what I'm gonna be preaching on is the days before the flood, the days before the flood. So the subject of this sermon is what life was like on earth before the flood. I'm sure you've read through Genesis a little bit and have questioned a few things, maybe like why people live so long, well, who were the sons of God spoken about in Genesis six, what is going on? What is life different? What's life like before sin? What's life like after sin? I'm going to explain all those things. Obviously, if I'm hitting seven or eight chapters, because remember, the flood doesn't end until Genesis 8. You know, Noah gets out of the ark. He sacrificed unto God. And at that point, that's when the flood's over. He's out of the ark. Things are, things are done. But Genesis 1 through 6, there's a lot of information. And one thing I want you to understand is that I'm not going to go through like creation and those. I'm talking about life. What was it like in the days before the flood? What, what is life like for people? What, what, what is it? What is going on? What's different than right now? And I think this sermon will be very interesting for most of you because um, there's a lot of things in here that I had just recently well, that be revealed to me like about man and woman about god himself what what it was like these types of things are going to be very interesting which is why i was a little late before because i was finishing up this sermon i i had not planned on writing this sermon but once it came to me I decided to go with it so let's start off in genesis chapter 2 we'll read verse 7 and 9 uh, 7 through 9 it says and the lord god formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul so what can we learn from this well one that god is creating man out of the dust of the ground right what is he saying he's saying your flesh is earthly he's saying that you were formed from the earth but what in in you is from the Lord, your spirit, right? Your spirit is what is from the Lord. And when your spirit forms in, uh, when your spirit enters into your flesh, it becomes a soul. That's why sometimes when the Bible says that somebody was caught up into heaven, they were in the spirit. That's because their spirit was separated from their flesh. Your flesh is one thing, your spirit is another thing. And when your spirit and your flesh is, are together, they're the soul just so you can understand that verse in the beginning of verse eight it says the lord god planted a garden eastward in eden why is that significant well it's significant because what is what is it saying that god himself planted a garden notice what it says in the next verse it says and out of the ground made the lord god to grow every tree so the lord god is not physically making the trees grow. he's making them grow by his power but what does it say about the Garden of Eden? It says that he planted it himself. He planted a garden eastward in Eden. It didn't say he made a garden grow up out of the ground. It says that he planted a garden. Why is that significant? It's because God himself is on earth at this time. And he's doing things in the way that he wants man to do them. This will play a big significant role as we get later in the sermon. But these are things that what life was like before the flood god is on earth he's on earth and he plants a garden in eden he brings adam to the garden of eden let's look at genesis chapter 2 verse 15 it says and the lord god took the man and put him into the garden of eden to dress it and to keep it and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And then it says in verse 18, And the Lord God said, It is not good for the man that, shall, shall he, that he shall be alone, and I will make an help meet for him. So what, what God is doing is he is bringing Adam to the the garden that he planted and he tells Adam you're gonna dress and keep my garden you're gonna be taking care of this garden and then he says you're gonna need somebody with you you know it's not good that you're alone I'm not always here 
But God is, is do, do you ever hear people saying, oh, I was talking with God before? No, that doesn't happen. That's not happening today. But what was happening back then is that people were literally interacting with God. God was on earth. Why? Because there's no sin on earth right now, right? There's no sin on earth. God's just walking amongst his creation. Let's look at uh, verse 21. And it says in verse 21, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, ribs and closed, the, closed up the flesh instead thereof. And you know this story. He forms woman out of, the, out of the man, right? And this is the help that was made for him. But notice what it says in verse 25. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Why were they not ashamed? Well, one, they were not ashamed because there was no sin on earth. They had no idea that they were naked. They didn't know they were naked because you only have the knowledge of good and evil after you sin. God talks about this in Deuteronomy, and he says, um, your children which had no knowledge of good and evil, then will I bring into the land of Israel. What he's saying is, when you don't know the difference between good and evil, you're going to naturally just, you're, you're not committing sin. You're not, you're not just like a, what a Catholics believe. Catholics believe you're born in sin, right? Like you are sinful when you come out of the womb. No, you're sinful when you make a morally bad decision and you know. That's why Paul says in Romans 7 that I was alive without the law once, then sin came, then sin, then sin revived and I died. So Paul is saying when I learned the law of God, when I knew that something was right or wrong, then my spirit died. That's why God tells Adam and Eve not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil so that they don't learn what evil is so that they can commit evil. All right. One important thing to learn from this is that who created Adam, right? God. But one thing that people don't understand and people love to skip over, have anyone ever heard of people talking about Genesis chapter 6 where it says, and the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bear children unto them and some of those children were giants and those became men of renown. And the book of Enoch says that sons of God were angels and the angels came down from heaven and mated with humans and they created 300 foot tall beings. What they're missing here is who the son of God actually is in this context. And we just learned who the son of God is. I'll prove it to you. Turn to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. Just like an intro, but I promise you're going to learn some things you've never known before. Luke chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 36. Sorry, I have a new Bible apparently, and this is pages stuck together. Verse 36. It is on page 809. Verse 36, page 809. It says, it's going through the ge genealogy of Joseph. Who's Joseph? Jesus' supposed father, right? But really, Joseph is just the husband of Mary. God is Jesus' father. Let's read verse 36. Which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Arphaxat, which was the son of Sem, which was the son of Noah. No, he is Noah. Which, I'm, I'm sorry. Which was the son of Lamech, which was the son of Methuselah, which was the son of Enoch, which was the son of Jared, which was the son of Mahaliel, which was the son of Enos, of Seth, which was the son of Adam's father, which was the son of God. So is the son of God? Adam, right? Obviously, we're not talking about in a spiritual context. We're talking about in a fleshly context here. Jesus is the only son of God. The, the Trinity is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They all are God and have always been. But when God creates Adam, 
That is his fleshly son. Son is to beget something. So what does that make all of Adam's children? The sons of God. If, you've, if you haven't learned this from the Old Testament, they'll go through, like let's say you're, you're in the Old Testament, you're reading like uh, 1 Chronicles or 1 Kings. God will speak to one of the kings in Judah and he'll say, David, your father. Even though David was like seven generations above him, right? It's his, probably his great, 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 great grandfather. But what does that mean? That means that he's calling him a son of David, even though he's like the eighth generation. How can we apply that to Adam? Adam is the son of God. Therefore, his children are the sons of God. Now let's jump to Genesis 6. Jump to Genesis 6. The reason I went over all that is for these verses right here. Genesis 6 on ver uh, page 5. And if it's easier for people, you can just listen. You know, you, you don't always have to turn or look. It, it's just... I'm going to say every word that you need to hear. Genesis 6, verse 5, it says, And God saw the goodness of man in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented. And now jump up to uh, verse 1, and it says, and, I came, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. So what is God explaining to us here? He's saying that when people started to multiply, and there was a lot more people than just Adam and a few sons, there was Adam, his sons, his sons' sons, and all their kids. There's a lot of people around. And God's saying the sons of God saw all the women that they were beautiful, and they took them wives of all that they wanted. And what happened? So, so who were the sons of God in this scenario, if we're only a few generations after Adam? Adam's great-grandchildren. They're not angels. There's nothing indicating that they would ever... The, the Bible never calls an angel a son of God. Not once throughout the entire Bible. If you didn't know that, I have documentaries and sermons on it. But the sons of God in this context are all the great-great-great-grandchildren of Adam. God gave us that answer in Luke 3. Who is the son of God? Adam, it was going over everyone's father. And, and Enos, who is the son of Lamech. And then it says, and Adam, which is the son of God. So all the people on the earth are Adam's descendants, right? They're all Adam and Eve's descendants. They're multiplying. They're, ma they're making uh, children, obviously. And what, what do we learn from these verses? Well, look at verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days. And then what does it say? And also after that. So what is God saying? God's saying that there was giants in the earth during Adam's time, during the days before the flood. And there's also giants in the earth today. They're the same giants. There are giants today. Giants are people that are much bigger than regular people, right? Like most regular people, what's like an average height? Like 6'4 is like really pushing it, but like, you know, anywhere from 6'6 down to like 5'5 five, five foot is like a 99% height range, right? Obviously you have outliers, but what are those outliers? Well, those outliers are giants and then what the Bible calls dwarfs. They're just a genetic difference, a genetic mutation. The reason God is bringing this up, he's saying that they started taking so many wives that out of them had a genetic, it's not a, it's not a I don't want to call it a mutation like the world calls it. It's just a genetic variation to where somebody became taller than the average height. And God calls them a giant. What do you call somebody who's much shorter than the average height? Like at age 30, they're like three feet, three foot six. A dwarf, that's what the Bible calls it. Would you say that an angel had to come down and mate with a human to make a dwarf? 
No, of course not. So why do you say that an angel has to come down and mate with a human to make a giant? It's just a genetic variation, just like we have today. So what, why is that significant? God put all the genetics of, human, of the human race within Adam and Eve. What happens as time goes on? As time goes on, people start to get isolated, right? You have, some, you have instances like the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel, people all join together and they try and build a tower up to heaven. God says that nothing is going to be withholding from man. So now he splits up all the people into different na nations and changes their languages, right? Then what happens? Well, now when you go to a specific nation, you can tell the people apart from like a tourist, right? Like if you go to Spain, you'll see all Spanish people and then you got like one European guy there and you're like, he's not from here, right? You can easily just see it. You don't even have to speak to him. What is that? That means that all the people in that region have very similar genetics, right? Because they all look very much alike. This is important to understand where different races came from. Different races are not, they're not technically real. You would call them like families, essentially, right? Because a certain family looks a certain way. My kids look like me. Adam, my wife says that their kids look like her. Uh, anyways, so uh, either way, they look like us. Adam has everybody's genetics. So when he's making kids, he has all the genetics within him. So he can have a Spanish child. Well, I, when I say Spanish, I'm just meaning skin color, right? Because that's all that we judge people on in that contest is the way they look. He can have a, a, a black child, right? But he, I'm, I'm talking about skin color. There, I don't mean in the, because race doesn't exist. That's what I'm trying to explain. Race does not exist. All genetics come from Adam and Eve. It's only when we isolate ourselves into a particular nation that race is developed. Mixing genetic variations. We're sticking two similar genes, right? All the people from one nation look very much alike and they all end up looking alike and creating people that look alike and then they marry people that look alike and they all keep looking alike. We did that because we all tried to join together and go against God. So God split us up. But in the beginning, it wasn't like that. Everybody was just getting genetic variations all over the place. And the reason you don't see that now, like you don't see you know, two white people having a black child, because our genetics, we have refined them so much that we don't have that variation anymore. We only have the genes that are possessive to our race now. But back then, it wasn't like that. Back then, you had all the genetics because you hadn't had hundreds and hundreds of generations of gene refinement. So all races were just around. And then when God isolates them, because remember, there's not a ton of people that God's, I, the, there's a ton of nations, but it's just like groups of families. God's just throwing one family here, one family in Japan, one family in China, and then they just make more that are, look like them. So, but I'm trying to explain to you what it was like before the flood. Adam possesses all, Adam and Eve possess all the genes of all, of every possibility. Therefore, they can create giants, dwarves, different skin colors, everything. All at once from Adam. You don't need an angel to come down to make some, no, Adam has it all. There's still eight foot tall people living right today. Everybody knows Shaquille O'Neal. He's a giant. He is a he is biblically a giant. You've seen a, a I, don't, I don't know what the politically correct term is anymore, but a biblically term. You've seen dwarves, right? It's still around, right? Nothing's different. Nothing is different. That's why it says there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. But it was different before the flood. Now. Let's look at um, Genesis 2. Genesis 2 on page 2. So 
So what's going on in Genesis 2? Well, we read verse 25 and it said they were both naked, Adam, the, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Why is that significant? Because what I want to show you in the days before the flood is the days before the flood and before sin are very similar to the days after the new earth is created. No sin happening, right? And God is with man. Look at Revelation 12. So where are we? We're in the very beginning of the Bible, right? Let's go to the very end of the Bible. Revelation 21. Revelation 21. We'll read verses 2 through 4. It's on page 883. I mean 983. 983. Like I said, if you just want to listen, it's only a couple of verses. <clears throat> Verse 2, it says, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. Going back to the way that he wanted things originally to go. But the way he fixes it and does it right this time is he stays on earth to rule rather than leaving man to his own devices and he gets rid of the devil. Because who beguiled Eve? The devil, right? That great serpent, the dragon. Look at Genesis 5, verse 3. You'll notice longer lifespans, right? Longer lifespans. Well, look at Genesis 5, it says in verse 3, it says, And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. So how old is he when he begat Seth? 130 years old. And then after that, verse 5, And all the days of Adam lived, and all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Adam lived 930 years. Why is that possible? How is that possible? Go to Genesis 6. I'll show you how that's possible. Look at verse 3, and it says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for, he, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. What, what is God doing here in this verse? He's taking away their long lifespan. How is he doing it? By leaving the earth. God was in the earth. God was here. Walking with earth. Walking on the earth. If you're in the presence of God, one, there's a lot less sin happening, right? When, when a sin happens in the, in, in the first, uh, you know, three chapters, even four chapters of Genesis, it's like immediately announced because it's very, very different than the way things were supposed to be. But God's spirit is here on earth. That's why he's saying my spirit's no longer going to strive with man because he's flesh. I'm getting out of here. I'm going to heaven. I'm going up. I'm not going to come back down. Obviously, there's instances in the Old Testament where it comes back certain miracle for a certain thing to save somebody from something but he wasn't walking around like he is like he is here let me show you some examples that he's literally on earth look at genesis three no genesis four So here's the story of Adam and Eve. They, they make, in verse 1, they, um, Adam knows his wife, and they bear Cain. Then Cain is a tiller of the ground. That's his job. That's what he does to, to get food. And then if his brother Abel watches the sheep. And so Abel brings the Lord an offering of the first, firstlings of his flock. And then Cain brings some of his whatever he got out of the ground, you know, some, some, of, it, some of his tilling of the ground. But God, what does God li like? God likes a sacrifice, right? That's what God wants. It's, it's an example and a picture of, of Jesus. That's what he wants. So God doesn't respect Cain's offering and he respects Abel's offering. Abel gets furious. I mean, Cain gets furious. 
that Abel's offer was accepted and his wasn't. So he finds his brother. If you look at verse um, 6, and it says, The Lord said unto Cain, Why, why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou now be accepted. He's saying, If you just brought me, just next time bring me an offering of the flock, and I'll accept it. I don't like that offering because it's not what I have told you to bring me. So Cain gets upset. Look at verse 8. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field, Cain rose up again against Abel his brother and slew him. Cain kills Abel. Then what do we see here? It says, The Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. And he said, What, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art there a curse from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. He's literally talking to God on earth. Just having a conversation. He, he, he's, not, he's not like surprised by the presence of the Lord. Because he sees him regularly. Where is he? He's in Eden. Cain is with Adam and Eve who are in Eden. And Cain's in Eden. That's where God's at. Notice it says in verse 16, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Where was he? He was in Eden. And then God says, you're not allowed here anymore because you just killed somebody. And I, I can literally hear it from the ground. And now you've got to leave. And he says he went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelled on the east of Eden in Nod. Because God is still in Eden. Another telltale sign that God's still here on earth on, at this time before the flood is the tree of life is on earth. Where's the tree of life when in, on the new earth? It's in the kingdom of God, proceeding from the throne of God. Well, the river of life is proceeding from the throne of God, and the tree of life grows on each side of it. So God was on earth, living on earth, with the river of God coming through, and the tree of life was there. It says, let me bring Abel and his wife out of the Garden of Eden, lest they eat of the tree of life and live forever. They, God was on earth. That's why, that's why people could live for so long. Because you're in the presence of the Lord. How are you just going to start decaying? It's, it, it's not, that's how powerful just being around God is. What, what, do we, what do we see with Jesus? If somebody went up and just touched Jesus' shirt, they were made whole. Right? No disease. Wouldn't that be even more so if God the Father, they're all on earth? Just being around the glory of God, you're, you're, it's going to be like impossible for you to get sick. If all you have to do is touch Jesus' fleshly body on earth when he comes for 33 years, you just touch him and you're completely made whole. Because that's what it says with the woman who had the issue of blood. She touched the hem of his garment and was made whole. How much more so we're literally living on earth in the spirit form? My spirit shall no longer strive with man, for he is but flesh. He's saying, I can't be here any longer. He's becoming too fleshly, and I'm, I'm, spirit, I'm spirit. I have to leave. And they would have, Adam and Eve would have lived forever if they didn't sin, right? We all have read Genesis through, uh, one where God, Genesis, I'm sorry, Genesis two, where God is forming man. And then he tells them, and they even acknowledge it, that if he, they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that they shall surely die. And they didn't die right there. He meant your spirit will now die and you're going to die in the future. Before their spirit was completely alive, untouchable, but they commit sin. And then they have a termination point. So now let me show you some cool things about what happens now after sin has been committed. Now that sin's been committed, right? Adam and Eve, and you know, things are still going on. Remember, people are still living very before the flood, but then right before the flood, God, that's not going to happen anymore. I'm leaving, and, my, and man is going to max out at like 120 years, maximum. That's what God says, my spirit shall no longer strive with man, for he is but flesh, and his days shall be uh, 120 years. Now, 
let's learn some cool things about the curses. Obviously, there's nothing good about sin, but the information from these curses is going to be interesting. Let's start with animals. What is the curse now for animals? Because remember, you may not know this, there were three people, three things involved in the first sin, right? An animal, a woman, and a man. What was the animal? Well, Satan was using the serpent. What, the woman, Eve, and then Adam, the man. So all three need to be cursed because all three were involved in the sin. What's the curse for animals? Look at Genesis 3. It says in verse 14, So in verse 13, it says, The Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, So the serpent's curse. The serpent represented animals in general, all beasts. Why? And it says, And the Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all and above every beast of the field. So what is God saying here? You may, you may not realize this, but oftentimes in the Bible, you'll just jump over something that is pretty major. And it's because the Bible has multiple sh subjects in a single verse, but you're, uh, mo most of the time when you're you know, first reading the Bible or um, you know, looking for something specific, you'll only look at the focal point. What's the focal point of this verse? The serpent, right? But what does God say here? He's saying, you're cursed above all cattle. What does that mean? That also the cattle are cursed. You just get the worst curse. He says, All cattle and above every beast of the field and upon thy belly thou shalt go and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life and I will put enmity, enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed and I shall bruise thy head and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. So what's the spiritual application of this? One, that Satan's against man, right? That's a pretty easy one for people to figure out. What's the physical application of this? Man was not always against beast. Man ruled over beast, but it wasn't like you saw a lion and you were worried that lion was going to eat you. That didn't happen. That's He's saying, I'm making now, I'm making you and them all of her seed and all of your seed enemies. Isn't, is that not true, right? You go up to an alligator, you're not going to pet it. It's going to try and eat you. Let me show you some references of this. Because that's pretty significant, right? Remember when God says, starts looking for a help for Adam? What does he do? He starts bringing all the animals before Adam. He's not like worried like, oh... Don't bring that lion to me. It's going to eat me. He doesn't even know that yet. He doesn't even know that lions are aggressive. Let me show you that in the Bible. Look at um, Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11. Remember, I'm comparing before the flood to the new earth, what it's going to be like. And, what it, and we can actually use things from the new earth to show you what it was like before the flood because that's how it was always supposed to be. Go to Isaiah chapter 11. And if you just want to listen, you can just listen. Isaiah 11, let's read verses um, 6 through 9. It says, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. I believe that before... The sin before man, beast, and, and woman, everything was totally at peace. 
Notice how it says the lion. It's saying, this is actually talking about in the future. It's, look, it's talking in verse four. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of, Je uh, I'm sorry, verse one. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and the branch shall grow at his roots. It's talking about Jesus ruling on earth. And it's saying what it's going to be like. He's saying there's no enmity even between animals. He's saying a little one can lead a lion and a calf and they're not going to eat each other because the lion's going to eat straw like the ox. That's total peace. And I believe the earth was like that before sin. That's a, I, don't, I don't think animals were just murdering and eating each other and like just ripping them. They were all just eating grass like an ox. But then sin comes and God's like, that's their curse now. Their curse is enmity. And it says in verse 8, And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp. Do you know what an asp is? It's a venomous snake. He's saying a baby can just sit, when Jesus is around, a baby could just sit on a, on a viper's den. And the viper would be like, you cuddly little baby, and just play with him. And that's how it was before sin. Verse 9, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. When God is in Eden and physically on earth, you think animals are killing each other in front of him? Nope. Pure peace. Nothing bad happening. Then sin comes and all bad things happen. Now, what's the woman's, what's the woman's curse? The woman's Genesis 3 says in verse 16, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire... Okay, so let, let's start there. One, he multiplied her conception. What does that mean? You're going to be pregnant now for a long time. Two, multiply your sorrow. It's going to hurt. To have children. That's your punishment. And then what's the third thing? And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. What does that mean? That means that beforehand, Adam wasn't ruling over her. What does that mean? That means after we die, women are not being ruled over. That's their punishment for committing the first sin. God said now because you committed the first, because who, who sinned? Even the Bible says this, Eve. And then she deceived her husband. So her punishment now is that now she's no longer equally in charge. Now she has to be in subjection as well as all her children. And he gave that power over to the man. But... What happens when the new earth comes? All curses are removed. So her curse is submission. Turn to Matthew 22. Matthew 22. Matthew. Yeah, just Matthew. You can just say brother Matthew. We're all saints, some Saint Tyler. Wait. Brother Matthew 22. What's the page? Uh, we're going to look at 776. 776. All right, so Matthew 22. So if you're ever upset that you have to like submit to your husband, just get mad at your great, 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 great grandmother, Eve because it's her fault. But you still got to do it. Just like I still got to go to work because my great, 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 great grandfather Adam sinned. That's how it works. So we both have to live under the curse until we're out of the curse. That's how God does things. <clears throat> Matthew 22 says in verse 26, 
It's talking, verse 25, Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife's son to his brother. So it's talking, the, the people are coming to attempt Jesus, right? So they give him a, a, a parable, essentially. They say, one man had a wife. And then the law says that his, his, when he dies, his brother should take her if he didn't raise up kids. So his brother takes her, they don't have children. Then his next brother takes her, and they don't have children. Then the next brother after that, still no children. And it says in verse 26, Likewise the second also, the third unto the seventh, and the last, the woman died also. So what they're saying is, whose wife is she if she had seven husbands, which is in a proper way, and she had seven husbands when she dies, right? Because they're asking, who's she going to be in subjection to? Who is she going to be in subjection to when she dies, right? Because she was in subjection to the first, the second, the third, all the way down to the seventh. And then what's Jesus' response? He says in verse 28, Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all have. You err not. God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. That's why the Bible says that men and women have equal inheritance, because it's no longer that the woman is in subjection to the man. You're not married. The only time the woman is in subjection to the man is in the marital situation, right? And obviously, the reason that women can't be pastors, the, the reason that women can't be presidents and those types of things and rule is because then they have to tell their husband what to do, right? Amen. So they can't be in subjection. So they're, they would be disobeying God's commandment. That's why they can't be preachers. That's why they can't be pre because they're not fulfilling the subjection. But when they die, who are they in su subjection to? Not their husband. They're not married anymore. Just Jesus, just like men. And that's what it was like before sin. That's why God says your punishment is now your desires unto your husband and he shall rule over you. Because before it wasn't like that. <clears throat> now lastly, the man, this isn't um, crazy interesting. Um, actually, it's kind of interesting. So j jump to Genesis 3. This will be the last thing I'm going to go over. Genesis 3, last couple verses. Verse 17, it says on page 3, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. When I read this sometimes, I don't feel like I'm living in this way. I don't feel like I'm always like upset about the ground. You, you know what I mean? Like I don't feel like I'm cur I, I know I gotta work, and sometimes work is hard. But not to this extent, where like every day is sorrowful when you're eating it because it's only bringing forth thorns. And then I finally learned something. And I'll show you what that thing is. Go to Genesis 5. Look at verse 28. And it's uh, verse 29. And he called his name Noah, saying, The same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. Notice, this is Lamech speak speaking. It says in verse 28, And Lamech lived 182 years and begat a son. So he's saying, Noah is going to comfort us concerning the ground. What, it, what he's saying is, it's, it's real bad back then. Like, it's really bad. Like, everybody's upset that they can't get food out of the ground. Because even God said, it's just going to bring forth thorns because of your sin. And then look at chapter 8. Look at chapter 8 of Genesis. I've skipped this 
I've read this so many times, but it didn't really hit me until today. Look at verse 20. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled the sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. The curse was lifted after the flood. That's why we're not experiencing that. That's why sometimes when I read that, I'm like, my, you know, is it that bad? And just in Genesis 5, it said, he will comfort us concerning the toil of our hands. Who comforted him? Noah. It said, Noah will comfort us concerning the toil of our hands. Yes, obviously, man's, pu man's punishment is still that he has to work and provide the bread. But the ground itself is not like every time you plant an apple tree, you're just getting this horribly dead tree full of thorns like it was for them. Because God really cursed the ground for them because he was so mad about the first sin. And it says in verse 22, while the earth remaineth, sea time and harvest, cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. Notice he's saying, I'm bringing back the sea time and the harvest. Those things are, 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 are going forth and day and night, they're not going to cease. I'm no longer ending. I'm not going to punish man that bad anymore. Because he, that was the worst punishment ever, right? Killing all of the earth except for Noah and his sons and their wives. So I wanted to do this sermon because it's like, that's it. That's all I'm going to go into. Um, I wanted to do this sermon because it's like a picture of what God wanted the earth to be like and how man ruined it and then how God saved it. Because before, God's on earth dwelling with men. He makes Adam and Eve, they're having kids, they're all in the Garden of Eden. How do we know that? Because Cain's talking to God and then God's like, you gotta leave now that you killed somebody. God's got an awesome garden in Eden that he planted himself and Adam's just tending to it, it says. It also says in um, when Adam and Eve find out they're naked that they hide behind a tree and it says God was walking in the midst of the garden in the cool of the day. Have you ever read that verse? It's cause God's just there. He's just like with you. And it's awesome. But once sin starts, as it says in Genesis 6, wickedness in man, the thought of his heart was only evil continually. God's like, my spirit's no longer going to strive with man. He's too fleshy. I'm leaving. And therefore, his days are only going to be 120 years. But what's the picture of it? In the new earth, what are our days? Forever. Because God's with us. We're no longer in sin. We're made new. We have received a glorified body, and the fleshly body is gone. And all those things that were happening before, where animals aren't like murdering each other and killing, trying to kill us, all gonna happen again. You have a pet lion if you want, just like bring him around and he's just like with the other calves. It's gonna be all peace and all good things for Christians. I'll do another sermon in the future on what it's like for not Christians on the new earth, but for Christians, it's gonna be as it were, as it was for Adam and Eve in the beginning. Sorry, I didn't write up anything over here. It's gonna take too long. I'll close this in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you very much. Thank you for the wonderful things we can learn from your word and the things that we can uh, continue to grow in. We pray that you will bless us and guide us and help us, Lord, to just be more and more like you and more and more in the way that you want us to be on the new earth in your kingdom. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.